Hello, this is uh, Joseph Asamoah, and I want to thank you for um, taking time out of your busy schedule to um, to join this webinar on the landlord in in the DC metropolitan Washington area. That's Washington DC, Maryland, and Virginia. My name is Joseph Asamoah, and some people call me Dr. Joe. Uh, essentially, what I want to do in this webinar is uh, share with you some of the lessons learned, experiences, do's and don'ts. Um, you know, if you want to venture into the buy, fix and hold arena. And obviously if you're gonna hold properties for the long term, which I truly believe is the vehicle to build wealth, um, is to buy, hold, buy properties and keep them for a long time. And there are lots of benefits to that. Um, including appreciation, obviously that's the increase in value, which is really marketable, market, uh, market especially in the Washington DC area. And also for cash flow, passive income, tax benefits, and uh, the ability to um, build wealth, have a legacy, uh, something you can pass on to future generations, and so on. So obviously if you're going to um, venture into this uh, arena, it's really important that uh, you know you learn from others, and you avoid making what I call unnecessary mistakes. So the purpose of this session today is to share with you some of my experiences and uh, and so on. Well, uh, why DMV landlording? Um, you know the, the reality is that in the Washington D.C. area, um, the laws are, if anything, are more pro tenant as opposed to pro landlord um, which is you know there are, there are pros and cons to I, either of those but as they say it is what it is and therefore you need to be able to operate under that reality it is a minefield and uh, if you don't know what you're doing you could easily step on a landmine and um, you know and get blown up and uh, so what I'm trying to do here is to share with you some of the insider strategies, things which I've learned over my, uh, over my 30 years um, of being in this business. And uh, the reality is that uh, it is a business. And uh, if you're entering this business like any business, the assumption is that you know what you're doing. Uh, ignorance is not bliss. If you end up in court, you cannot say to the judge, well, your honor, uh, I didn't know. Um, that is not a, a plausible uh, excuse. Uh, the reality is that you should have known. There are laws, there are rules, there are regulations that you have to abide to, uh, because what you don't know can come back to bite you and haunt you, and it'll cost you in different ways, both in terms of time, stress, money, and, um, you know, it's just a very, um, it's not a good thing to, um, to be sort of um, uh, blindsided by um, things that uh, were preventable that, um, you know, have hit you and you just didn't know what happened. So it can be very expensive if you go through what I call the school of hard knocks. So, um, so who am I? Uh, my name is Joseph Asamoah. Uh, some people call me Dr. Joe. Uh, as I mentioned earlier on, I've been in this business. I bought my first house in 1987, uh, over 30 years ago, in uh, Columbia Heights, Northwest Washington, D.C. Uh, that's how I paid over $40,000 for a house. I know you find it unbelievable, but uh, at that time, people were telling me I was getting ripped off. I was paying too much for this house. I was being naive because uh, I was buying real estate, um, you know, and so on and so forth and so on. Well, I still own that house as of today and 30 something years later, and that neighborhood has transformed. And what was uh, $40,000 is now five, six, seven, eight hundred thousand dollars $800,000. And, uh, and so I'm not saying that to brag or to, uh, to show off. It's just that that's the reality of uh, real estate investing. Over time, it does appreciate in value if you pick the right area, if you know what you're doing, you're able to navigate the minefield, and if you can select and um, maintain good tenants. 
So, um, you know, in addition to that, I've spoken to most of the clubs in the area, uh, most of the real estate investor clubs in the area. Uh, I'm a blogger uh, for Bigger Pockets, and uh, I've trained over 450 people over the years on what I do, my aspects of real estate investing. So I feel that, um, you know, I do have credibility to talk about this subject. And hopefully, uh, as we go through this presentation, you'll be able to share some of my lessons learned. In terms of um, buy and hold investor, I'm gonna kind of interchange the words buy and hold and landlording uh, throughout the discussion. But buy and hold essentially is to buy a house, uh, fix it up, and then hold it for the long term. And if you're gonna do that, obviously you're gonna be called a landlord at some point, unless you manage it, uh, unless you have other people manage it for you. But let's assume for this uh, presentation that um, you are the landlord, you are the owner, you are the one that's responsible for this asset and, uh, and so on. So really, as a buy and hold investor, your success, this is key, your success uh, or your failure will depend on two things. One, your ability to consistently attract quality tenants. You gotta be able to attract quality tenants to your house. And likewise, once they're in your house, your key to success is gonna be your ability to keep them in your house once they are there. Okay, it sounds very simple. It is pretty basic at a high level, but there's obviously, as you know, there's a lot of nuances to this, and the question becomes, how do you do it? Because if you don't do it, uh, then uh, you're gonna fall into this trap, and that is, um, you know, during the buying phase, when you do the analysis, you're going to go, you know, typically you're going to do analysis on whether should I, I should buy this house or not buy this house. Does the numbers work? What does a spreadsheet say? say? What's my return on investment? What's my cash on cash return? What's my return on equity? What's my internal rate of return? What's my net present value? Does the 1% rule? I mean, all these analysis tools uh, are important in determining whether you buy, but this is the big rut here, and that is all those analysis spreadsheets, calculations, and so on, are completely meaningless if you can't attract tenants who are gonna pay you and who are gonna take care of your property. Because if you can't find those people, then uh, all those calculations becomes uh, irrelevant. Uh, your equity will become zero, your cash flow becomes zero, your returns will become zero, and uh, you'll be driven out of this business. So all those things essentially will be evaporating in thin air if you are unable to um, find and retain good tenants. So the question becomes, you know, how do you find these people? How do you find great tenants? How do you find people that's gonna take care of your property? And a little secret here, which I've learned, uh, in fact, the hard way, is what I do now is uh, work backwards. I say, okay then, I'm trying to attract quality people, families, um, to the properties that I'm looking, that I own. So what are these people looking for? What are these customers looking for? What are these tenants looking for? And then once I understand who these people are, what their needs are, what their likes and dislikes are, then I then structure my business accordingly, i.e. I buy properties that these folks are more likely to be attracted to. I fix up my properties in such a way that I can appeal to the, uh, appeal to the likes and um, aspirations of, uh, of my customers, and I operate my business in such a way that it gravitates towards them. So it's kind of working backwards. You understand who your customers are, what their needs are, and then you, um, you know, provide a product and services that meets their needs. It's really business of 101. So I'm looking at this, I'm treating this as a business, okay? And every business has customers, and every customer has certain likes and dislikes. Uh, every customer has choices as to whether they should do business with you or whether they should do business with somebody else. So the question becomes, why should they do business with you? Okay. Once you understand that and you do the analysis, then you can provide your products and services that meets their needs. So to survive over the long haul, you must your real estate activities, you must run your real estate activities like a business. And every business has, at least for me, what I did was to say, okay then, if that's the case, if I'm gonna run this as a business, what business am I in? 
okay? And I'm in the business of providing quality housing, okay? I'm in the business of providing quality housing as a means to um, attract quality tenants who are going to stay, okay? So who are my customers? My customers, at least the people I'm trying to attract, are quality families or people who are looking for a quality home in a, in a decent neighborhood and are looking to rent from a quality landlord. Okay, that's what my, um, you know, my analysis suggests uh, these quality customers are looking for. They're looking for a nice house in a nice area uh, with good amenities in such a way that they can uh, live there, feel comfortable, and rent from a quality landlord. So my goal, since that's what they're looking for, is to provide that. I, I'm trying to satisfy these customers. And how will they reward me? If, um, if I have these products and services that they're looking for, they reward me by staying, i.e. they renew their lease, they stay with me for a long time. Uh, my longest tenant is 22 years, okay? I have 15-year tenants, 18-year tenants, 10-year tenants, 12-year tenants, 5-year tenants, and so forth and so on. That is not a coincidence, okay? That is not by, uh, that doesn't occur by crossing your fingers and hoping for the best. It occurs through a calculated strategy, okay, of understanding who your customers are, what they're looking for, what their needs are, and making sure you provide the products and services that meets their needs. So, what are these? So, uh, what are the customers looking for? And um, you know, why should they uh, rent from me? They're looking for superior comfort, convenience, overwhelming value, and um, and amenities which they can't get from everybody else, anywhere else. So as I said before, the tenants have choices. I'm not the only landlord in town. So why should they rent from me versus rent from somebody else? Okay, that's a fundamental question. Why should somebody rent from me, uh, especially if it's the type of customer or tenant that every other landlord is looking for, i.e. a tenant that pays their rent on time, a tenant who has uh, excellent rental history, a tenant that takes care of their property. Why should they rent from me? as opposed to somebody else. If I couldn't answer that question, then it becomes really like a roulette uh, wheel, whereby I'm gonna cross my fingers and hopefully they'll choose me as opposed to somebody else. I said, no, I want them to choose me as a first choice and therefore I have to run my business, I have to have a product, have services, which clearly differentiates myself from everybody else. And that's some of the things I'll discuss with you during this presentation. At a high level, uh, the process for buy and hold can be broken down into nine steps, as you can see from this, um, this um, page. Um, it starts all the way from preparing the property, uh, all the way through to include screening the tenant, moving the tenant in the house, managing the relationship, the day-to-day -day operations, renewing the leases, evictions, all the way through to in continuous improvements of the process. Okay, so I've broken it down to nine steps. And uh, what I want to do here is make some assumptions. The assumptions are as follows. One, uh, I'm not going to discuss uh, you know, the activities prior to this, i.e. finding a house, analyzing the house, raising finance, going to settlement, um, you know, going to closing, um, the renovation, finding contractors, um, you know, managing the relationship with the contractors, the draw schedules, permits. I'm not going to discuss all that because obviously that's part of another discussion altogether. So the assumption I'm going to make is that you bought this house, you fixed up this house, and now you are ready to rent this house. Okay, so I'm starting from here. You made a decision that I'm going to rent this house and hopefully you've prepared the property to rent. Okay, so prior to that, the assumption again is that you know the local rules and regulations in the jurisdiction where your property is located. In the DMV area, most of the um, uh, jurisdictions require that you be licensed, that okay? you have a rental license. In Washington, D.C., they call that a BDL, a basic business license, which has to be registered through the DHCD, Farm Housing Community Development. And also in Maryland, uh, most of the local jurisdictions require that you license your property. Uh, there's a process to do that, usually fill out some applications, there may be an inspection uh, that takes place, but ultimately 
you will get a license. So I'm assuming that you've done that. I'm also going to assume that you know the local rules as it pertains to preparing the property. For example, uh, I'm assuming that um, you know, most of the jurisdictions around here require that you do some kind of lead clearance, lead paint clearance, uh, which may involve taking um, dust wipes, XRF readings, and having a, a licensed um, uh, you know, lead clearance company come in, do tests, and certify that the place is ready from a lead paint perspective. There's no peeling paint, chip paint, the dust wipes are good, and the, um, you know, the house is certified as uh, lead safe. So that's the assumption. So um, now you are now ready to rent this house. So what do you do? Uh, most of the landlords out here just maybe paint, maybe put some carpet and make a place look decent and put it out there uh, for rent. I obviously, that's not enough. I stage my homes. Uh, I stage my homes in such a way that, um, you know, they look good they're well presented and the idea is to differentiate my house from everybody else's nobody else as far as i know stages their rental properties i think i'm the only one that does that um, because uh, i realized that uh, the decision to rent my property versus somebody else assuming that all things are equal uh, it's a decent house a decent neighborhood the rents are very similar uh, as close to quality uh, amenities and so forth. Assuming that that's all equal, uh, I realized that the decision to rent, just like the decision to buy, is a very emotional decision, okay? Uh, it's based on people's emotions. So what I try to do is to appeal to people's emotions on my properties. So when they first walk through that door, the place is uh, it's presented well. It looks very professional. It looks like they could just as well move in they can visualize themselves in my home as opposed to an empty house where there's really no emotions and they have to figure out where's the dining table going to be, where's the couch going to be, where's uh, the TV going to be, and so forth and so on. In my properties, that, those decisions, um, they don't have to worry about because they can see it. It's already done for them. And therefore, it becomes a matter of, do I like this house? Do I not like this house? Do I like this neighborhood? Or I don't like this neighborhood? And so forth and so on. So uh, I, I realized that the decision to rent is an emotional one, and therefore I build in emotions into my properties during the staging process, and uh, and so on. Which then leads into the second part: is okay. Then I'm going to now uh, tell the whole world that my property exists for rent. So I'm going to market this property uh, generally. Most, most people these days um, rent uh, or place their properties through uh, online. Uh, online, um, you know, things like uh, uh, Zillow, um, through Craigslist, um, DC Housing Search, Go Section 8, and all these different platforms which, um, you know, uh, are used to find tenants. Okay, so it's all online. So one of the key things to online is visuals. And that's the reason why I have all my photographs, all my properties, sorry, photographed professionally, and I also do virtual tours. So that way, from the comfort of their home, they can see the house uh, in a good light because it's staged, and also they can do a virtual tour. They can literally walk through the house and, and see exactly what the house comprises of from where they are. They don't even need to come to my home to get a feel for what the, uh, what the house is all about. So again, the idea is to build excitement, is build a desire to come and see this house because it stands itself out from all the other um, properties which they're looking at, which doesn't have any of these things. So uh, through um, you know, creative marketing, uh, great creative language in the marketing ads, ultimately um, I get a, you know, a lot of people that want to come see the house. So we kind of move on to step three here, and that is uh, they come to your house, they look at the house, they like the house, and, um, and then they have to make a decision. Do I want to apply for this house or do I want to keep on looking? Uh, let's make the assumption that they want to apply for this house. Uh, the first thing I do is to give them a rental application. Uh, my applications are eight pages long. It's very detailed, very, it's quite, I would say a little bit uh, intimidating, but, um, 
But my goal is to understand who this applicant is and learn more about their rental history. Because uh, the screening process, if you make a mistake here, will be a disaster. If you make a, uh, a mistake here, you could end up with a tenant who's not gonna pay you, a tenant who could destroy your house, a tenant that can make your life grief, and a tenant that can sort of run you out of this business. So this screening uh, step is by far the most important one, and you really do need to take the time and take the due diligence to do this right. My belief is that every prospective tenant has a rental history. Everybody has a history. And your job, uh, at least in, in my opinion, is to understand that history and do the due diligence to find out about it and then make a qualified decision as to whether you want to select or rent to this person or not. Uh, there's lots of stories I can share about that one. Uh, in fact, I, I had a house, uh, my, in fact, my, one of my recent houses where uh, it's in Northeast Washington, DC. Uh, the tenant, um, I placed an ad, a prospective tenant uh, called, uh, she came to the home and she loved the home, fell in love with the home and uh, never forget what she said. She said, I love this home. And uh, in fact, I woke up this morning and I had a dream uh, that uh, I would look and go visit my dream home. It was a vision from the Lord. Uh, Jesus had told me that uh, today would be the day that uh, I would find this great house. So she was sharing this story to me. It sounded good, it sounded very plausible. And uh, obviously, if someone's talking about religion and uh, you know visions and things like that, the assumption is that um, you know they're, 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 they're quality people, they have morals, they have standards, they have, um, you know, um, a good background and so on. So uh, she was saying all the right things, which I think uh, all landlords want to hear. So she filled out the application. And uh, one thing that brought to my attention was um, where she lived. Uh, you know, I asked her why she was leaving and she said that the landlord wanted to uh, sell the property. And for prior to that, she had lived in a shelter. And uh, so I asked her, you know, what happened? How did you end up there? And she said that the previous place before that, uh, the owner, uh, they rented there for a few years apparently, uh, wanted, the owner had died and uh, wanted to sell the home, the family wanted to sell the home. A um, couple of little red flags because in DC, generally, um, you know, you can't, uh, as long as a tenant is living by or abiding by the rules, i.e. they lease, it's usually, um, you know, a bit more difficult to get somebody out of your house. Anyway, it's a plausible reason, so um, I took it on face value and started my screening process. So what I found by digging further was that, first of all, um, the when I called the current landlord who wants to sell the house, surprisingly, uh, well, probably not surprisingly, uh, he gave great reviews about the family. They were fantastic people, he said. Uh, they kept the place up, he said, and they were a joy to rent to, he said. And obviously he had his own hidden agenda because he wanted the house back. So I would assume that, um, you know, he's gonna give me good things, good reviews. So I did uh, do some more further digging about uh, the previous uh, house where she lived at, checked the court records and found out that she had been evicted. She had been evicted from this home, this home whereby uh, she said that the, the owner had died. Uh, it just so happened that the owner still owns the house He's still alive and, um, you know, and so on. So clearly that was a story that was not true. And I only found that out through my own uh, due diligence and my research because on face value, she was the ideal perfect tenant. I did do a home visit to a home and uh, kind of interesting story is also when I went there, uh, she opened the door and there were a, a pit bull dog um, was there as well. And this dog, you know, knew the lay of the land of the house. You know, he's walking around like uh, he lived there. And I said, well, you know, what's going on? Because on the application, she said that she had no pets. Well, apparently she said that this was the owner's dog. And when the owner travels, then, uh, you know, the dog stays with, with them. But I had spoken to the owner uh, the week before. So he was definitely in town and this dog was there. So um, there's a lot of red flags, which I can talk about later on, but uh, essentially the point is, if you don't screen your tenants properly, 
Um, oh, yeah, there's another one. She said that, uh, I, I did visit the property on a Wednesday, and she said that uh, on a Wednesday, uh, the family goes to Bible study. And, but because I was coming on a Wednesday, the whole family will stay behind. Uh, so again, she was playing that religion uh, thing to me. She didn't know that I had already done my own due diligence and uh to uh you know to sort of verify some of the information but again the important thing is that if you run your business from your gut she would i think would have probably uh got through most um i would call amateur landlords uh she sounded good she was very presentable she spoke well she her demeanor was very very uh very nice and um you know her gut feeling was that she was perfect she's the ideal tenant but through some uh, digging around, you find that uh, she was probably a professional tenant because she'd been evicted. Uh, she obviously was giving her current landlord grief such to the point whereby he wanted to get rid of the house and wanted to pass her off to somebody else, uh, i.e. another unsuspecting landlord. So again, one mistake there in step three could have derailed my business. And hopefully uh, this is um, you know, a case study on what you should do uh, in situations like that. Uh, step four, avoiding fair housing. This is a really, really important um, uh, topic. Uh, there are protected classes, uh, you know, race, national origin, sexual orientation, and so on. I don't know exactly how many there are, I think they're about 10 or 12. Uh, in Washington, D.C., for example, another protected class is income source. Uh, you cannot uh, discriminate uh, based on the source of income. So for example, if a person has a voucher, uh, a Section 8 voucher, then you can't discriminate against them based on that, on that income stream. And again, if you don't know the rules, you could be, run, especially if you run your screening process based on gut feeling, um, you're gonna be open to um, a fair housing suit. You're gonna be open to some kind of claims of discrimination and so on. So how do you avoid that? You avoid that, at least what I do, is to have clear policies. Uh, these are the rules. This is what um, I'm going to go through as part of the process to screen and select people. And that applies across the board to every single person. So I check, for example, rental history, current landlord, previous landlord. I make home visits, uh, check on tenants uh, in terms of their credit, uh, in terms of their, um, you know, what's it called, uh, making sure that they can uh, pay the rent, the income stream, and things like that. So it's really important that you have clear policies which you apply to everybody and not selectively to this person versus that person and so on. Otherwise, you open yourself up to a potential fair housing suit. Uh, now let's assume that you've how uh, we'll move on to step five. The assumption now is that you have your tenant in place or you've identified a tenant and uh, then you go on to the, um, you know, the, uh, the lease up process. Um, you know, for me, again, based on experience, I have a 20 page lease. It's very detailed, it covers everything. Um, I mean, I know you won't believe this story. I had a tenant once who had a cookout in my living room, okay? The lease uh, didn't address that, uh, you know, didn't. I mean, she had a barbecue there, and, um, and uh, what's it called? The smoke detector was blasting. She was just ignoring it, having a cookout, having a good time. And, uh, and, and so on. So obviously my lease now addresses that. That's a lease, a lease violation. And uh, there's lots of stories about uh, what tenants do and how you should mitigate all that. And your lease document, your agreement is the key. Because if you are holed up in court, then um, you know, the document uh, that uh, they're gonna refer to is your lease agreement. And in Washington, D.C., for example, um, oh, where, where do I start? Uh, in Washington, D.C., for example, if you want to evict somebody for non-payment of rent, for example, if your lease doesn't have the following sentence, okay, tenant waives the right to receive a 30-day notice for non-payment of rent. If you don't have that sentence in your lease, and you probably won't have that if you bought your lease from Staples or Office Depot or Office Max or, or, or wherever. Um, you know, one of these boilerplate leases that you get off the internet or go to the, the store. 
if it doesn't have that statement, then uh, if a tenant doesn't pay you, you have to give them a 30 day notice to correct the problem. So let's say, um, let's say for argument, say we're in August and the, and the tenant, the rent is due on August the 1st and the tenant doesn't pay you. Usually most landlords have a five day grace period. So on the 5th, uh, if the rent hasn't been paid, then a late fee is due. So let's assume that the tenant hasn't paid you on the 6th, they haven't paid you on the 10th, they haven't paid you on the 12th, they haven't paid you on the 15th, and so forth and so on. Okay. At some point, you're tired of the excuses that they're giving you, and then you want to start redress or get redress in the court. So you'll probably uh, file papers. Uh, so if you're in Washington, D.C., let's assume that your, your rental agreement doesn't include the text tenant waives the right to receive a 30-day notice for non-payment of rent. It doesn't include that because you got it off the internet. So uh, you file on the 15th, uh, the court papers, and then you know three or four weeks later, you get a court date. Uh, so let's just, that takes us to September. Let's just say for argument's sake, you get a court date on September the 15th. And uh, you have a very sophisticated tenant that you're dealing with. So you go to the court, and you go to the judge and the tenant says, well, your honor, I didn't receive a 30 day notice for non-payment of rent to waive, to correct the problem. And the judge will look at the land, uh, the tenant, uh, la sorry, the landlord and, uh, and say, is that true? Um, and you'll say, well, no, I didn't give them a 30 day notice uh, for, to correct the problem of non-paying, I just filed. Uh, based on that, uh, that reality of the case is dismissed. So we're in the middle of September, the tenant hasn't paid you since August, and the case is dismissed. So your request, uh, your redress is to give them a 30 day notice, okay, to pay the rent, which will now take you from September to October. And after that 30 days, if they haven't paid you, then you get another court date that takes you from October to November. For well, that time, no rent has been paid from August. So we're talking three, four, five months. Um, just because your lease didn't have this one sentence. Okay. So these are some of the, uh, you know, the realities of, um, of being a landlord in the, uh, the you know, in, in this case, Washington, DC, uh, it is what it is, but obviously if you knew your lease would address that and you wouldn't have to wait 30 days, you can file straight away. And, uh, and since you're a professional landlord, you know how to navigate the minefield down at the courthouse and you'll get your, um, case uh, hopefully approved and passed and judgment will be in your favor. So it's really important to make sure that your documentation, your agreements, your leases, uh, disclosures, rules, um, are compliant with local uh, rules and, um, and they are in your favor. Moving on to, again, each of these things, I could spell, probably spend a whole day talking about all this, but um, for the sake of time, I'm just moving on. So number six, set and collect rents. You gotta have a system whereby people pay you on time. And uh, I do all my rents now electronically. Uh, I tried the other way where you knock on people's doors, collect your rent, and you know how that goes. Um, you go to the house, knock on the door, you know, uh, the lights go off. You know, you can hear whispers behind the door. Shh, 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 shh. landlord's here, be quiet. And no one opens the door and uh, you leave. 10 minutes later, all the lights come back on and uh, you go through that ritual. So obviously I don't do that anymore. And I'm all about electronic uh, payments because there's a paper trail and so on. So anyway, we're on to number seven, implement day-to-day -day operations. What's the process that you're gonna have for dealing with issues like repairs, maintenance, calls, lockouts, um, you know, lease violations and things like that. What are your rules uh, to address all those things? And I could talk about that forever. Then moving on to number eight, now that the tenant's in, uh, what's the processes for renewing the lease, evictions, terminations, and so on? How are you gonna handle all that? Uh, you gotta have processes, procedures for that. And then what I do for step nine is I like to always, uh, every so often, step back, look at my business, see how it's doing, and identify areas where I'm doing real good, and identify areas where there could be improvements. And I try to focus on that, to, to try to establish some continuous, continuous improvements in the business that I have. So what you see here on this uh, slide is the high level view of the buy and hold process broken down to nine steps uh, from when the, uh, the preparing the house for renting 
all the way through to selecting a tenant, moving the tenant in, managing their relationship, and uh, continuously monitoring your uh, business for improvements, okay? So putting all this together, what does this all mean? Um, so um, I'm gonna talk to you here about, uh, I'm gonna kind of move on to some of my, um, I just call them top tips, I suppose, for finding, keeping, and managing tenants. Okay, this is based on over 30 years experience, being a, a buy and hold investor, being a landlord in the DMV, and uh, going through the school of hard knocks, I've been through four real estate uh, market cycles. So I know how this, this stuff plays out. And what I'm gonna share with you are some of the, um, my tips for uh, you know, doing that. Okay, number one, uh, don't rent to anyone before checking their credit eviction history reference to the background. I think I talk, kind of talked about that earlier on. Um, so screening, if you don't screen well, if you don't, um, uh, get the right person in your home, you are setting yourself up for failure. You are setting yourself to be driven out of this business. There is nothing worse, believe me, there is absolutely nothing worse than having a professional tenant in your house. There's nothing you can do about it to get them out, and they are driving you crazy. You have no peace of mind. In fact, they're looking at you and smiling at you and laughing at you because they know that they have the upper hand and there's nothing you can do about it. That is a testament of frustration. I've been through that before, and I want to spare you uh, that happening to you. So please, whatever you do, make sure that you do the necessary due diligence in terms of the screening process. It's really easy to get someone in your house. It's a lot more difficult to get them out of your house once they're in. Uh, some crazy stories. I mean, I remember one time I went to the courthouse in DC. There was a landlord who lived in California. He had a house in DC. Uh, the tenant was there for a while. At some point, the tenant stopped paying rent, and uh, he's in California. And ultimately, I assume that he didn't have the money to pay his taxes. The property taxes were not being paid. Uh, the house went to a tax sale, and guess who bought the house? The tenant. So this tenant didn't pay their rent. The landlord couldn't pay his taxes, and the tenant bought the house at a tax sale. Isn't that crazy? Uh, but it is what it is. You can't make this stuff up. Okay, tip number two. Get all your uh, important things in, uh, in writing. Uh, it's really uh, important that, uh, I think I'll give you some examples, that your rules, uh, you know, agreements are documented. Uh, what are the tenant rules uh, in terms of quiet hours? Are they allowed to have pets? Uh, are they allowed, how many people are supposed to live in their home? Who's supposed to be living there? What is termed an occupant versus a guest? Uh, what's the security deposit? What's the mechanism to return the security deposits? All this stuff has to be in writing. It can't be verbal because if it's verbal, then it becomes a matter of he say, she say, and so on. So it's really important to get the important documents uh, or at least in important terms in writing. Tip three. Um, Establish clear fair system for setting, collecting, holding, and returning security deposits. Security deposits, it's a big, big bone of contention with a lot of tenants. Uh, obviously, most tenants are looking forward to getting their security deposit back. And most landlords want to make sure that the house is returned in such a good condition whereby they don't have to spend an order amount of money in order to get the house back again. So there's a, there lies the, the, the potential conflict. One person is expecting all their money back. Another person saying, no, you can't have it back because you uh, caused the following damage. So what is the mechanism that you have to have in place to avoid that potential confrontation? And uh, lots of different things you can do. I know for me, I have inspections, uh, especially checklists. So before someone moves into my home, uh, we verify the condition on day one. And uh, also when they uh, are leaving, uh, there's clear um, prices for damage. If you damage this wall, this is how much it's cost. If you do this, this is how much it's gonna cost. Therefore, there's clear uh, criteria as to how much it's gonna cost you in terms of uh, take money is taken away from your security deposit. Because if you don't do this, then uh, you're gonna end the relationship on bad terms you're gonna end up with possibly one party suing the other party in small claims court and, um, and so on. So this is a, 
are really important. And there are rules as well uh, as to how you handle uh, security deposits and the return of that money. Uh, most of the jurisdictions around here, you have to return it in 30, 45 days or 60 days. Uh, you can't keep it indefinitely and you have to have uh, clear documentation as to how that money was applied. You have to pay them interest and so forth. Tip number four, stay on top of repairs, maintenance needs, and uh, you know, make sure you do repairs when requested. Uh, this is important also because um, one of the biggest bones of contention from a lot of tenants is that they have a landlord who's not taking care of the house. Okay? And uh, so if you don't do that, I uh, take care of repairs when it's necessary and, um, and so on. A, couple, a few things is going likely to happen. One is that uh, if it's a health and safety issue, um, the tenant may call the city or the local jurisdiction um, and file a complaint against you. And then you'll have an inspector come over from the city and uh, you open up a whole other set of kind of worms because obviously that inspector is going to be looking for things to cite you on. Uh, number two, the other thing is that if you don't take care of repairs, there's a pretty good chance the tenant's going to leave. Okay, um, you know it feels like they've told you about problems, you kind of blew them off, and uh, and so on. So after a while, they get kind of tired of that, and uh, there are so many cases whereby. Uh, prospective tenants call me and say, you know, the reason why they're leaving is because their landlord doesn't fix the property. Uh, the landlord, you know, all he wants is just the rent. That's it. He doesn't care about the house. doesn't care about my complaints or my concerns. He just wants the money. Uh, so if you uh, are not careful, your tenants are going to leave and uh, look for somewhere else. The third thing, uh, if you don't take care of your repairs, is that, uh, you know, they may end up, Stop paying your rent, okay? They may decide to say, well, I'm not paying you unless you fix these things. And, um, you know, if you go to the, in front of a judge, um, that could be a plausible excuse that uh, the judge will hand over, especially in Washington, and, um, you know, against you and in favor of the tenant. So make sure that um, you stay on top of repairs. And as a landlord, you know what your responsibilities are and you take care of those responsibilities in terms of the property. Okay, tip number five, don't let your tenants and property be easy targets for criminals. And the perception obviously is that you know, you're know you the owner of the house, you're the rich guy, you're the rich woman, and uh, they don't know that you know, you're know you struggling just like they are, and just trying to do you know, the right thing and for your family and so on. So don't be a, um, a target. Or um, for someone like that. So how do you do that? I mean, there's different ways. Uh, I, I try to, uh, you know, have insurance, um, you know, different layers and uh, entities, and just managing the relationship with your tenant is really important to, um, you know, to prevent the situation whereby people go after you, um, you know, for lawsuits and things like that. Uh, I mean, I can talk about that based on experience. So let's, let's say an example would be, um, I think I may uh, talk about that a bit later on. Well, I'll talk about it now. Um, there was a tenant who moved into one of my properties and after um, three months, I think it was, um, I got filed a lawsuit uh, from this, uh, from this tenant. It's crazy. Uh, find, it finds out that, um, this tenant had a, a child who had an elevated blood lead level, okay? And, um, and it's kind of strange because she just moved into my home. Um, but what it found, you know, she had one of those lawyers, you know, you got a phone, you got a lawyer uh, kind of guys, uh, ambulance chasers, and uh, their mode of operation is they want to sue everybody. And anybody that's, that's in the chain gets served as part of this suit. So since she lived in my house, I got dragged into this lawsuit. And essentially what happened was that the, um, uh, the previous place where she lived at uh, was uh, abandoned property. And that's where the, uh, you know, the child um, you know, got the elevated blood level from. It was from that property, not from my property. Because my property was pretty much uh, in great condition. But it was a good experience because I learned um, you know, exposure to that thing. You know, that some landlords are exposed. And uh, based on that, I learned what to do. And I implement a lot of different things into my uh, processes now to avoid uh, those situations from happening in the future. 
So, um, you know, this is just a, a word of warning uh, is that uh, some people will, you know, uh, perceive you as a potential easy target. Uh, number six, uh, respect your tenant's privacy. Yeah, I never, never, ever, ever go into someone's home unless they're home. Um, you know, I, I just don't. Uh, the reason being is that if you go to the home and they're not there because they may trust you as a landlord, well, you know, you got to do some repairs. So therefore, I'm not, I'm working right now, but you can go and, and, and take care of whatever needs to be done. I say no. If you're not there, I'm not going to be there. Uh, or you must have somebody there to open the door. Uh, because you hear too many stories of, um, you know, uh, a maintenance person or a landlord going to a house, do some repairs, and then the tenant accuses the landlord of theft. Well, my jewelry is missing, my gold watch is missing, and um, so you must have stolen it, or one of your guys must have stolen it, and so on. So to avoid all that, uh, I will never go to someone's home unless uh, they're present or someone's there physically to open the door. And also, I think it's the right thing. You don't want to just sort of do that. And also, uh, you want to give people ample notice, usually at least 24 hours a notice um, that you'll be coming to their home and uh, you agree on that. Uh, obviously, if it's an emergency, like there's a fire or there's a flooding, but that's something else. But for just general repairs, which is about 99% of the case, uh, it's important that you respect people's privacy. You don't just knock on the door and come in and um, you know, show respect and hopefully uh, the respect will be reciprocated as well. Number seven, I think I talked about uh, environmental um, earlier on about lead disclosure, lead paint. It's a big deal here. Uh, most of the jurisdictions in the DMV have some kind of rules uh, pertaining to lead. Uh, there are federal rules, there are federal disclosure requirements, there are local dis uh, disclosure requirements, and also there are clearances that you as a landlord are required to do, especially if your house was built uh, prior to 1978. Uh, I mean, that in itself is a whole day session uh, about lead clearance, lead uh, disclosure, um, you know, and so on. But uh, most insurance policies nowadays do not cover lead. And therefore, if you don't um, protect yourself uh, by putting all these different uh, disclosures and uh, steps in place, you could be exposing yourself for a potential lawsuit there as well. Uh, number eight, choose and supervise your manager and maintenance people very carefully. They are essentially a uh, representative of you. Uh, the manager, uh, whether it be a property manager or um, the maintenance guy or maintenance person, uh, they're a reflection of you. If you have people who are not professional, if you have people that uh, you know, uh, are very rude, uh, people that are argumentative, it's gonna reflect on you. I've had stories of that whereby some of my, I have some pretty um, tough ty uh, client, uh, customers and no nonsense and things like that. I've had maintenance people who also have, are no nonsense as well. So it's like a, you know, um, a potential problem of, uh, waiting to happen. There's arguments, there are discussions, there are heated you know, confrontations and things like that. But at the end of the day, I'm, I have learned that uh, you have to be very, very careful who is representing you for your business. If they're good people, uh, which is what I look for, then usually they can diffuse situations and they can conduct themselves very professionally. And, um, you know, it becomes a, a, a pleasure uh, for them to work with you. Okay. And, uh, Tip number nine, uh, make sure you have enough liability and property insurance that, you know, kind of, uh, I think is pretty self-explanatory. Um, you know, you have, you're, you're exposed. Uh, you got to make sure that you have the right insurance, uh, whether it be liability, property, umbrella. Uh, I now require that all my tenants have uh, renters insurance, um, primarily because, uh, I mean, my properties are insured by me, or, you know, I'm insured, sorry. Uh, but the tenant stuff is not. So if there's a fire, if there is theft, if there's a burglary, uh, my stuff's covered, but theirs is not. So uh, I always try to encourage and uh, highly recommend that they purchase their own renters insurance for their properties. Tip number 10, try to resolve disputes uh, uh, with tenants. I mean, you will, uh, what's it called, have disputes. Uh, you will have uh, areas of disagreement. Uh, I invest heavily in my relationship with my tenants to make sure that it's a good, positive, 
business relationship such that uh, they're happy, uh, such that they love the home, they love the neighborhood, they love um, the amenities there, and they're very, very grateful that somebody offered them the opportunity to live there. They're not going to jeopardize that. And therefore, if there are issues, there are problems, we can usually resolve them uh, without having to go to court. We can usually resolve them without having to get lawyers involved, and without having to have lawsuits and things like that. So because your relationship with your tenant is by far the most important one. So uh, what else do successful landlords know? What do they know? Well, this is what I've learned is that um, at the end of the day, satisfied customers stay longer, take better care of the property, pay their rent, and uh, they're just more pleasant to deal with, okay? Um, as I said, the, the testament of that is that a lot of my family stay a long time, and 5, 10, 15, 20 years, etc. cetera. Uh, it's because of this realization. And uh, beside the, the property itself, the most important asset that I have is the relationship with the tenant. The tenant is by far the, the greatest asset that you have. They're the ones who are allowing you to realize your financial independence goal. They are the ones that are providing you with passive income. They're the ones who are providing you with a legacy that you can pass on to other, others in, uh, and so on. They're the people who hopefully will protect your investment. If you don't understand that, then um, you know a lot of the things which I've said you probably think is alien. Why are you doing this? Why are you? you know, it's crazy. No other landlord is doing this. I'm doing this because it's good business. Okay. Every Mother's Day I give my tenants bouquets of flowers. Every Christmas I give them presents. I do a lot of things here to differentiate myself from other landlords because I understand this is a business. I understand that they have choices. I understand that um, you know through them I'm able to accomplish. Um, you know, my financial dreams and, uh, and so on. So it's really critical that you go the extra mile to invest in building and nurturing that relationship with your tenant because it does really, it really will pay off. So I know we've been kind of talking for a little bit now, so I'm kind of trying to wrap it up, but this is just the tip of the iceberg. I mean, there is so much more to buy and hold, invest in, landlording than what I've covered today. And um, I could go on for another week on this on each of those different areas um, but obviously I don't have a week so how can I help you as a DMV landlord and this is how I can do that uh, I feel that uh, it's an area whereby you know we you really need to know what you're doing and uh, I have the experience to share and uh, with you but it's just um, strange that um, in, I have um, a couple of properties one's in Washington DC and one's in Maryland, which the tenants have just vacated. Okay, the one in uh, DC, the tenant was with me for about nine years. And she is a voucher holder, and she's been upgraded uh, from a four to a five. And she's moving from Washington, DC to Silver Spring, Maryland. So she's leaving. Likewise, I have another property in Bellsville, Maryland, where the tenant's also leaving at the, at the same time. So what I'm gonna do, um, because of this situation is I've created two sessions. Uh, I'm going to do two sessions. One's in Maryland for those people who are looking to invest in Maryland as buy and hold landlords. And also going to do one in DC for those people that are interested in, in learning in DC. So uh, essentially they'll comprise an on-site visit to the property. Um, you know, the, the DC one and also the Maryland one, depending on which area you're interested in. Then you'll see one of my properties in real time. We'll have a session down there where I'll talk about uh, some of these uh, points which I've made in this presentation in much, much more detail. Uh, I'll go through some of the new intricacies, some of the nuances about how I do, how I run my business, and uh, it'll be at one of my properties so you'll see in real time what's going on. Um, I'm also gonna give you a copy of my rental application, the eight page rental application, very, very detailed. We kind of use that as a, ba uh, as a baseline as I go through the, um, yeah, the process. That's part one, uh, it's a half day session. Part two, which is I think is probably just as important, probably more important, we're gonna go out to the courthouse. Uh, so for the DC one, we're gonna go to the courthouse in Washington DC, and for the Maryland one, since this property is located in Beltsville, Maryland, we're gonna go down to the Prince George's County, um, uh, landlord tenant court in Hyattsville 
um, at, the, at these courthouses, you'll see in real time um, cases that will blow your mind. Uh, cases of how landlords who don't do what I've just described to, this is the place where they end up. You don't want to be there, uh, you know, if you can avoid it. Okay, so you'll see exactly how cases are handled. You'll see scenarios that will blow your mind. Um, so, for instance, in Washington, D.C., at 9 o'clock, there's a roll call. Um, you know, the judge is going to sort of talk about the do's and don'ts and uh, how the process is going to work. We're going to sit on some cases uh, where you'll see, you know, what's going on. You hear stories which you wouldn't believe. Uh, all the horror stories uh, that are out there you experience. And the reason why I'm doing that is because I think it's important that you know. It's important that you see. And it's important that you say, okay, this is what I'm getting myself into. And that's not a bad thing. Uh, I'm not doing this to scare you. I'm just doing this because I think it's important for you to know. The first time you go to court, you don't want to be in front of the judge. You want to be able to at least go down there, understand what's going on, and hear the cases, and hopefully learn from those experiences such that you don't end up there. So I'll be doing a little session to give you some background about what to expect, and that way you can understand what's happening when you actually do go down to the courthouse. So for those people who are interested in Washington, D.C., I will be doing a session of my Washington, D.C. house in more detail, I'll give you the rental application, and then we'll make a field visit to the Washington, D.C. court. For those folks who are interested in Maryland, then uh, we'll do a session at one Maryland house, and then uh, we'll go down to Prince George's County Landlord Tenant Court. Uh, since it's Maryland, whether it's um, Prince George's County, Montgomery County, Frederick, uh, Talbot County, the, the, the process is essentially the same. So what works in Prince George's um, you know, is the same as what uh, is in other jurisdictions. This is truly a unique opportunity. I don't usually get um, you know, these vacancies that happen very often, but uh, it's happened. And so I wanted to provide that opportunity for you to get an insight into how I uh, run my business such that hopefully uh, you can take that and, uh, and be able to um, you know, avoid um, you know, mistakes and hopefully be able to implement and leverage in my experience. So how much is this gonna cost? It's only $99. It is extremely reasonable. I'm not trying to gouge anybody. I'm not trying to um, you know, dig into your, you know, make my millions from this. Um, I believe that um, the pie is big enough for everybody. I believe that we need more uh, landlords. We need more people who want to do buy and hold. I believe that um, this is a vehicle to create wealth. This is a, a vehicle to uh, pass a legacy to your family, to your children, to your loved ones, and, um, and so on. Real estate does work. So it's important that if you're going to venture into this space that you do it properly. So um, it's, uh, it's, 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 it's a great opportunity. Uh, there is a link uh, attached to this webinar if you would like to register. Uh, it's $99. The first session will be taking place next week um, at my Washington, D.C. house and also my Maryland house. So please, time is of the essence. Uh, you know, sign up. I look forward to working with you. I look forward to uh, helping you grow. I, I look forward to your success. I look forward to, um, you know, for you creating passive income and doing this business the right way. So please register via the link, which is attached to this, um, this webinar. And, um, and then finally, if you would like to communicate with me, I am on social media. Uh, you can, uh, you know, I'm on Facebook, Instagram, um, my website, and also I'm a contributor to Bigger Pockets, which is the largest uh, real estate community in the world and uh, I write uh, regularly for them. And so I like to connect with you, I like to help you, I like to communicate with you. So uh, if there's anything else that I can do to help you, please let me know. Um, I wanna be a success to you. Uh, I wanna be able to hopefully uh, help you on your journey and to navigate these minefields, uh, which are the buy and hold space. Uh, I hope that you found this uh, presentation helpful and informative. Uh, I look forward to working with you. So again, please sign up.
if you're interested, time is of the essence. We will be having the session next week. And I uh, look forward to working with you. So have yourself a, a wonderful day. And thanks a lot.